Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Andres Carrasquillo. I am a community engagement specialist from the Southern California Association of Governments. And I am very happy to welcome you today to the second webinar in our series, uh, this one entitled Building Partnerships and Generating Support. We have some great panelists today who are sharing their perspectives on the, on the uh, essentialness of creating partnerships with communities in order to move forward at safety projects. A few meeting logistics to get us started this morning at uh, this webinar length is approximately uh, one and a half hours. Please take care to mute your audio and phones. And if you're on the phone, hitting star six uh, will mute you. At the end of the presentation, there will be a question and answer session, but at any point dur during the presentation, feel free to type your question in the chat box. And we log all questions, uh, so that's why we can answer them later in the Q&A. If you think of anything later, uh, you can email me at carrasquillo at scag.ca.gov. If you have any questions on how to spell carrasquillo, don't worry, it's phonetic. Um, all presentations will be emailed to those who registered to participate in today's webinar. And uh, before moving on, I do want to shout out the partnerships that uh, we have on this call. We have quite a bit of SCAG staff and staff from Auto Club who are, you know, who, who have been working um, to put this uh, presentation on. Uh, Dorothy Lesochkova will be monitoring the, uh, the chat box. Uh, to make sure that all your questions are, um, are, are seen. And Jennifer Martinez is uh, stewarding us along as our IT support. So we really wanna thank uh, all the staff here who are making this webinar happen. Uh, the presentation, there will be three presentations today. Uh, the first will be uh, presented by Councilwoman uh, Arliss Reynolds of the city of Costa Mesa. We'll then move to uh, Lizette Arzola, the Associate Director of Central City Neighborhood Partners. And finally, uh, Chairwoman Hillary Norton of the California Transportation Commission and FastLink DTA, DTLA will um, cap off our presentations. And Mike Blockstein, uh, Co-Principal of Public Matters will be our moderator. And I'll pass it along to uh, Mary Ann uh, to provide an overview of AAA. Hi, uh, thanks, Andres. Um, so first, I just want to thank all the panelists for joining us here today. And um, I, I mean, this is a really important panel for us. Uh, and for those who don't know me, my name is Marianne Kim. I work for the Auto Club, also known as the AAA. So among other things, I'm their point person for active transportation policies and some other programs uh, having to do with mobility and safe mobility. Um, I want to welcome back everyone who joined us last week for the first of the series about how COVID has changed the transportation environment. We learned a lot about new data on traffic safety and other driver behavioral trends during that panel. And I think uh, it segued really nicely into this new panel on the next one about partnership to, partnerships to uh, address some of those issues. Today, uh, we're here to listen to this panel discuss their experiences on forging partnerships to reduce injuries and collisions especially for active transportation users. The Auto Club and uh, AAA, uh, we engage in many activities to reduce serious collisions. And it's, it's in, basically in our interest as both a business and a community partner. In addition to some of the research and sponsorship programs and our targeted uh, safety campaigns like distracted driving and uh, impaired driving, we put out a lot of educational materials. A lot of those educational materials and the free safety classes that we put on we couldn't do those without the um, uh, support of our community partners. And uh, we coordinate with them. And in a lot of cases, they peer review our materials. Um, in partnering with Go Human on this panel series, we hope we can uh, all learn about these new opportunities to engage and partner more with uh, many of you in the audience. Um, I'm going to, I think, uh, 
if you, I just want to add one more thing. If you have any more, if you, you know, we, partnerships are really important to us. So if anybody else has some ideas on how you can work with us together or how we can support you and your campaigns, please give me a call. I, Andres, if you can push to the next slide, my contact information is there. Um, I, um, I, the other thing is, uh, I think for everyone who included their emails and their mailing addresses or particularly their mailing addresses at the time of registration, uh, we sent out registration packets that had everyone's bios and uh, it, it also included a catalog of AAA classes, uh, free classes and materials that is open for nonprofits to distribute. And, uh, but if you have ideas on other materials that you'd like to work with us on creating or uh, uh, ways that we can uh, uh, work more in the community, please contact me. And uh, I don't know if this is an incentive, but we also passed out face masks to everyone. So uh, uh, they're like AAA Go Human commemorative face masks. So please let me know, we have plenty of them to share and I can send some along your way. So thank you again for everybody. Thank you, Andre. Thank you, uh, SCAG and Go Human. We really appreciate this opportunity to partner together on this and we hope there will be more opportunities in the future. Thanks. Yes. Great, thanks, Mary Ann. Sure. So uh, let me see here. Uh, I'll provide a quick overview of, of SCAG and Go Human. Um, SCAG is the nation's largest uh, MPO. We are 191 cities in six counties of Southern California, which encompasses 18.9 people. And together we are the 16th largest economy in the world. Um, Go Human is SCAG's active transportation safety and encouragement campaign. Uh, we uh, have, we do work primarily in three buckets. First is our regional advertising campaign and co-branding. We also provide uh, a lot of safe, temporary safety demonstrations and programming. And then we also run uh, safety workshops, webinars, and technical assistance to provide education to those in the region. Go Human uh, launched in 2015 as an acknowledgement uh, that, um, that there are a disproportionate amount of uh, serious, serious injuries and fatalities for those who walk and bike. So this was a way of both um, creating more safety and encouraging uh, safer, um, safer use of these modes of transportation. And at the same time, we acknowledge that safety looks different uh, to different populations. And we um, make our encouragement with an understanding of structural oppression and racism. And our work here is guided in part by the uh, recent resolution that SCAG's regional council adopted to close the gap of racial injustice. And so here is um, some information on that resolution and how it um, really calls on the agency to, to think about how to close this gap. Uh, also during the COVID-19 pandemic, Go Human recognized the uh, shifting environment and it expanded the concept of traffic safety so that it intersects also with public health and equity. And we want to expand the conversation beyond vehicular violence. And here, and some of our in considerations uh, in part include safety in public space, reimagining enforcement, and then riding transit safely uh, while following public health guidelines and safety for those frontline workers. So, Thank you so much. And at this point, I will uh, pass it along to uh, Mike Blockstein to moderate. Hey, uh, good morning. Thank you, Andres. Um, so my name is Mike Blockstein. I'm the co-principal of Public Matters. We're a Los Angeles-based creative studio for civic engagement. We've had the pleasure of working with uh, Go Human on a couple of traffic safety campaigns we call Slow Jams. Um, and I really am excited about talking about partnerships because that's not just central to what Public Matters does, but it's, it's central to really the question about how, how we move towards addressing these issues which are complex, right? And, and the wonderful thing about our panelists today is that they all 
share a strong commitment to traffic safety, to equity and sustainability, but they do it from very different ways, right? So we have uh, from the city council perspective, we have from the municipal and the statewide perspective and from the community perspective. And, and I think they all will have a lot to share. Um, and I'm um, just in terms of kind of the way it's going to work is that each panelist will uh, present for about 10 minutes and then we'll have uh, hopefully lots of time for questions and answers. Folks can certainly drop their questions into the chat. Uh, we'll be um, checking for them. Um, I, I may well drop in a few questions of my own, um, but um, I'm going to just give quick introductions so that we can kind of move along. So um, first, first is Councilwoman uh, Reynolds from the city of Costa Mesa. Um, among the priorities that she's been working on are improving public safety, making neighborhoods more walk and bike friendly and enhance, enhancing parks. Um, she'll be followed by Lizette Arzola, who is the Associate Director of the Central City Neighborhood Partners. And um, Lizette's work in the Westlake Pico Union neighborhood is really focused on addressing and improving the quality of life for all residents. And she takes a really holistic approach between the links between transportation advocacy and public health. Um, and then uh, we will have Chairwoman Hillary Norton, who is the Executive Director of uh, Fast-Linked DTLA, um, which is the Transportation Management Organization for Downtown Los Angeles, but she is also the Chair of the California Transportation Commission. Um, so, um, Councilwoman Reynolds, I'm going to pass the baton to you, please. All right, the uh, first test here is sound and visual. Do you see my screen and can you hear me? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. All right, <laughs> sounds good. Um, well, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you to everyone who's um, called in today, to all the organizations that are supporting um, a necessary movement to uh, improve street safety um, and to the many, many, many people who have helped educate me over the first two years of my council term on um, not just why uh, it's so important, but the how to implement these projects. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to be here today to share about a project that we um, implemented in Costa Mesa um, through a, a growing partnership, an evolving partnership between um, council and our priorities, our city uh, staff and transportation team, um, and an incredibly dedicated group of residents who've um, been working on safe streets long before I've been working on them. Um, let's see, let's see. Here we go. Uh, so I always want to start with the, the successes. Um, I think anyone who's probably worked on any uh, transportation project knows that there's a, a whole lot that goes on uh, behind the scenes. It's a lot of work. Um, so I like to remind myself of the, the moments of joy when we uh, are able to um, actually succeed in implementing a project. Um, this is a, a project that we implemented in Costa Mesa in August, um, so well into the COVID timeframe. Uh, it had two primary goals. One, of course, uh, to take the opportunity to demonstrate the, the quick build process and ways to um, different types of strategies to uh, calm traffic on our streets, which is, which is something I hear residents um, concerned about all of the time. Uh, so demonstrations of traffic calming strategies. Uh, but also from my perspective um, and the perspective of the city manager in our city, um, and we've talked many, many times about this project, this was really a test in a, in a new type of project and a new type of collaboration where um, in this case, the, the concept and the design of the project was really driven by the community organization, uh, Costa Mesa Alliance for Better Streets. So I want to share here the, the key partnerships. Um, Costa Mesa Alliance for Better Streets is our uh, resident advocacy group. Um, Sam there in the lower left corner is a local artist who became part of the project because beautification was a really important uh, aspect to the residents. Um, city of Costa Mesa, of course, including our council and um, our city manager and the transportation team. 
And then, of course, this project could not have happened without the support of the SCAG team through the Go Human campaign and funding from the Office of um, Traffic Safety. So I'm going to share a little bit of the timeline of the project um, and, and acknowledge first that this project is made possible by, by many, many years of advocacy in the city of Costa Mesa prior to you know, the, the timeline just around this project. Um, but the effort here really started, I think, with the establishment of the Costa Mesa Alliance for Better Streets. Um, many of the uh, advocates in our city have been um, uh, working directly with council members in the past. They participated in our city's bikeway and walkability committee. But one of the things we realized was that um, there was a lot we couldn't do from the community perspective without a nonprofit. And so it was in 2020, uh, yes, in 2020, that that group um, really organized and established itself as a nonprofit. And that was, a, I think, a game changer for being able to apply for grants like the Go Human Grant. Um, the Go Human Grant, of course, is huge. Um, and this was a really special grant because it was the first one that, that was coming in front of the Alliance for Better Streets that was specifically focused on giving money to community organizations. So that took away the need to first um, uh, get council direction to fund a particular project or to apply for a particular project. Uh, when the Alliance got the project, they did a whole lot of community outreach right away um, to develop sort of a vision for the, the project that they wanted to implement. They took that, they did that outreach in um, both online surveys and an online community meeting. They took uh, responses from that meeting then to sit down with the city transportation team to talk about what projects would be feasible given, um, given the input that they had collected from the community. That led to some conceptual drawings of projects they might wanna implement through the SCAG grant. Um, and the Alliance and the community group gave those concept drawings to our city staff which uh, created the final engineering drawings that passed all of the necessary safety tests to be able to implement these projects in our streets. The Alliance then took that information back to do additional community outreach to let the public know that this project was gonna be happening and how they could provide feedback after the project was implemented. That was a lot of work already. Um, and then of course we hit the implementation phase. Um, here are some photos from the implementation. And I just wanna share that this also was a, a very collaborative effort. Of course, our city transportation team was there to um, kind of guide and make sure all the uh, important safety rules were followed. But a lot of the legwork was really done by community volunteers, again, both members from the Costa Mesa Alliance for Better Streets, um, as well as other volunteers who are willing to help and you see there in the lower left corner are um, local artists who participated with some art as part of the design. Here is a, a scene, an aerial shot of um, the outcome of one of the roundabouts that we implemented at one intersection. There were actually two of these. Um, and then the project continued. So as the project was in place, there was a lot of community education, um, signage about what is a roundabout. We had some very robust community discussions about the, the pros and cons of roundabouts. Um, we had a lot of monitoring about how cars and trucks navigated around the roundabout. Um, lots and lots of fixing of cones. This was a lesson learned. Um, the cones were way too easy to, to move and got knocked over frequently. So the community volunteers were um, really valuable throughout the week-long demonstration to keep the cones in the right place and, and constantly adjust um, to keep the project uh, implemented as designed. Um, lastly, again, that celebration was important at the end of our week-long demonstration, um, but the project hasn't stopped there. There was, a, as I mentioned, a, a community survey on the results, and lots of data analysis continues, um, and we actually still has, have a debrief meeting for all of the organizations to talk about next steps on this project. Um, there's another visual of the project. Um, so I want to step back and then just acknowledge again the different partners who were absolutely necessary in making this project happen. Um, as I was putting this presentation together, I was thinking there's not one organization here um, that we could have done the project without. The Costa Mesa Alliance for Better Streets, our community organization, brought the vision, the energy, um, and really the persistence in, in getting this project done um, in addition to the natural challenges of sort of getting um, on the agenda uh, uh, during a time of COVID, you're, we're really, it's difficult to get resources and, and this project would not have happened without the energy of the Costa Mesa Alliance for Better Streets. 
Um, it would not have happened without our traffic team. We needed our, our city traffic team to uh, buy in and be willing to participate. And um, we had a lot of good conversations about why this type of project is valuable. Um, I'd like to say the project wouldn't happen without me. I think my job in this in this role was um, the pesterer. I was the one who just had to keep saying this is important, this is important, this is important. Um, and I could keep saying that because my community um, was saying that to me. Um, Selena Mendoza, our local artist, um, uh, added a, a huge amount of art to this project that created some fantastic visuals. Um, I think the project was absolutely made better by her participation. And of course, um, without the funding, this was about a $10,000 grant. Without the funding um, from SCAG and the energy and support from the Go Human team, um, the project wouldn't have happened. So really great collaboration. Um, and Mike, I'll ask you to, I could talk about this project for an hour, so I'll ask you to keep me time. I just want to share some of the outcomes of this project and why I'm, I'm so thankful that we were able to get it through and so excited about the future. Um, first, safety. So this is my mom. I'm taking a picture of her uh, biking on 19th Street into one of the roundabouts. And this one really touches me um, because she is afraid to bike on 19th Street. And this was a time where the traffic calming was working in a way that she felt comfortable to bike on 19th Street. And we biked quite a bit together during the week long demonstration. Um, bike safety for families. This was a, a photo that I caught just as I was um, driving, driving in this case down the street, a family of four able to cross the street where we had some um, temporarily bollards set up. Uh, and uh, more safety for families and kids. Um, this was this young boy here sitting between his parents learned to ride his bike this week and he was able to participate in the demonstration um, again because it slowed down traffic and it was something interesting so i thought this was a really neat opportunity for education this is one of my favorite moments um, towards the end of our week-long demonstration as i was biking through um, i noticed two boys who did a pop-up music show and this is something I've never seen at this intersection before. And it was just incredible that there was enough interesting stuff going on and the space had become safe enough that these boys were comfortable bringing out their, uh, I think those are cellos, uh, to play music at the corner. And I, I think that added a really um, unplanned spark of life that was really special. Um, to celebrate the project, we brought out on the last day our local youth mariachi band who, um, who sang um, a, a song of triumph uh, uh, to celebrate this project. And another pretty magical thing happened that we um, did not expect. This uh, mariachi uh, a mini concert, if you will, was intended to be really a, a celebration for the people who participated in this project. But over their about 20 minute musical set, a lot of community members came out, people from the nearby businesses, residents, they came out to, to hear what the, um, uh, what the fuss was, and um, neighbors met neighbors. And uh, this picture here is our local artist and a neighbor who came out because he heard um, he heard the mariachi music. Um, he came out, he met some neighbors, he met me, his council member, and then he went and bought lunch at the business behind. So we thought, here's another evidence of the economic uh, uh, benefits of these types of projects. Um, and then, of course, the, the art, the beautification of our streets through projects like these. Um, so I want to acknowledge again um, our two local partners, Costa Mesa Alliance for Better Streets. I encourage you to follow them and, and support that organization. And Selena Mendoza, our local artist. I am happy to uh, answer questions anytime, um, collaborate, and of course, hear opportunities for additional funding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman uh, Reynolds. That was fantastic, and I love seeing you in your in your bike helmet <laughs> in the photo. Um, so, uh, Lizette, um, would love to hear from you next, please. Good morning, everyone. Let me just uh, go ahead and share my screen. Okay, you can see it and hear me? Yes, looks great. Yes. Okay, great. Um, good, good morning, everyone. My name is Lizette Arzola. I am the Associate Director with Central City Neighborhood Partners. We are a nonprofit located in the city of Los Angeles in the Westlake Pico Union area. And I'll be discussing our most recent SCAG project and the title of my presentation is 
hyper local engagement tactics to identify safe routes. So as I indicated, uh, CCMP, uh, we're a nonprofit in, that serves the city and county of Los Angeles with a focus on Westlake and Pico Union communities. We look to fulfill our mission by advancing economic opportunities for low income and moderate income families um, and through fostering partnerships and supporting positive community change. Uh, through our mission, we have been active in transportation planning initiatives since 2006. Um, and we've had several recent ones through Vision Zero, uh, this Great Streets Project through the city of Los Angeles. And um, of course, the one I'm gonna speak about today is the SCAG Vinny grant that we received. Um, so this uh, mini grant came at a time, uh, a COVID time where we saw the opportunity to combine traffic safety with public health initiatives and with essential business. So uh, for us at C CCMP, we offer a lot of essential needs services to the community. And one of those essential needs services is a weekly food security program where we distribute food to, um, on average right now because of COVID, up to 600 um, unduplicated households a week. So 600 individuals from complete separate households will come um, and be provided with food. So we um, saw this project as an opportunity to combine the public transportation piece because most of the people that we serve um, do not have vehicles. They use public transportation, they walk to access their essential services. So we combined those three components of public health, um, traffic safety, and the essential needs. And for this project, we are, are, the main focus was outreach and education on how people can be safe and uh, access these essential needs during COVID. Our, our message, our main message was uh, public transportation is essential, so are you. Remember mask, distance, wash hands frequently. So the focus of our project, uh, we definitely wanted to share that information with everyone in the community because I think we all need to be um, aware of, of how we can stay safe during this time. Um, but we really had a focus on the low income households. Um, we know that most of the people we serve do come from that community and we wanted to ensure that they had the same education and information as uh, individuals from more affluent areas. We do know, as I said, most people use public transportation or walk to do their essential services and they have no other option. So um, it's really important that they know how to keep themselves safe during um, when accessing public transportation and what they can do. So they have a, that sense that they have a little bit more control um, over, over their safety and health. We also targeted older adults. Um, I, again, we know that Everyone knows that uh, older adults are more susceptible to the COVID virus. And uh, we serve a large population of seniors who, who come to our weekly food distribution and they have to go out. They have no choice. They don't either have families to, to drop them off food um, or and they, there's no delivery service for them. So we made sure to um, include in our educational materials um, we targeted older adults and having their older adult images on, on a lot of our materials. We also made sure to translate um, our information. Well, we had it in English and Spanish, which is pretty standard for us. Um, but we also know that the population we work with, there's a lot of dialect speakers, a lot of people who dialect, certain dialects are their first language or indigenous languages are their first language and Spanish is their second language. And then they're learning Spanish as their third language. So it's really important for us knowing that mainstream information and communication is not in a language that they can, that they feel comfortable with, that we were able to translate our materials into um, the indigenous language of Quiche. Um, and uh, people from Guatemala are, several, uh, a large population of people from Guatemala can speak Quiche and also into parts of Mexico. Um, and we know that the West Lake Pico Union community, this is one of the main indigenous language spoken there. Um, and although we do serve city and county of LA uh, residents, our main focus is West Lake Pico Union, which we uh, know has been um, impacted 
significantly by COVID-19 because there's a lot of people who are living um, in close quarters. Uh, we know people, a lot of people are on public transportation. Again, as I said, there's no other option for them. So the transfer of COVID-19 has uh, been more impactful. So uh, as uh, our method, so as uh, my presentation um, said, it's kind of a hyper local engagement. We did everything we could do to get our message out there. So we um, had a lot of written materials. So we, we made it, um, we made banners, educational boards, we had little flyers and we um, had giveaways from other partners such as hand sanitizers and masks that we combined with this message. We had e-newsletters, we sent postcards to people. We were doing, uh, at this time, doing cens uh, census outreach as well. So we combined all of that to help support this, this message. We were very active on social media. Um, we had a week long social media engagement where we uh, asked people, show us how you're stay staying safe during public, when you're on public transportation. Um, tell us how um, you're making sure, you know, what does it look like for you to get your essential, uh, to get your essential services completed. Uh, we sent out text messages to our community with our, our message uh, that I shared in the beginning. Um, and we did a lot of safe interactions because we're seeing people anyway for our food distribution. You know, we made sure that um, we can talk with them and say, you know, please put on your mask. You know, what are you doing to stay safe? We see you getting on the dash bus. You know, make sure, you know, try to sit, keep a, a distance between seats. You can go through the back door. So really having that in-person engagement with our community. And looking towards community partnerships, again, kind of bringing those in. We have a local grocery store just across the street. So we placed our educational boards at the grocery store and were able to communicate with people as they were do their, doing their grocery shopping. So this is our uh, sample of one of our, our educational boards. So it's for us as really looking at our messaging through an equitable lens. We know that uh, we wanted to keep the message simple. So um, I have two, two little kids, um, five and seven. So for me, could they understand this looking at it? So with them not being, my five-year-old couldn't read at the time. So um, I asked him, what does this tell you? And he was able to tell me, oh, I have to wash my hands, don't touch the button, use, use hand sanitizer. So that was really important for us because um, we know that there is a low literacy rate in our community. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that the message is accessible, that they don't have to read a lot to get the information. Um, so it was clear and educational. So making sure with all of the you know, wear a mask, don't wear a mask information out there that our message of, you know, safety is wear a mask, you know, two, six feet apart, hand sanitize, wash your hands, and helping people understand that and knowing that wash your hands before you leave the house and when you return. Another piece was the cultural relevance. That was, it's always number, really number one for us. We do serve a high um, Latino uh, population. And so, with the, um, this design of the flags, it's called papel picado, so a kind of cut paper. I'm not sure how to exactly translate that, but this, um, it's used around this time of October, November. Um, it symbolizes kind of the fragility of life. Um, it goes through with uh, Dia de los Muertos is celebrating um, those who have passed. And so this, for me, when we started this project in uh, July, August, September, knowing that if we design something in a way that we can keep up and it's still relevant um, and that people can understand, okay, we see why it's on there. There's a cultural significance to it. And again, all of our messaging was in Spanish, English, and Quiche. So in our eight week project, um, we were able to reach over 35,000 community community members with our messaging. Um, so that was through our, you know, Thursday giveaways, through all of our social media, through um, our group of uh, women that, uh, that work with us called Promotoras, um, who are engaged in the community and able to share the message um, and email interactions. So for, the, for us, that was really significant um, because we were able to I really feel successfully combined that message of public health, essential business that you have to get done. There's no way that, you know, it can't be done. And um, the safety piece with transit. 
And the, the benefits, um, like I shared in the beginning, we've been pretty active in the, in the last two years with the transit initiatives. And we see such a great benefit when we're asked to partner, when, um, when uh, traffic um, planning, urban planners, when, when groups that, ha that traditionally kind of make these decisions bring us to the table, it allows an opportunity to really hear the community's voice and bring it forward. Because we have that established presence in the community, we're trusted, they know that C us as an organization, CCMP, um, we don't really have, we don't sell anything. You know, we make sure that people have the resources that they need because we want to see the community thrive. And, um, and so when we're asked to partner, people hear us and they know that we will make, I mean, ensure that they have a voice at the table and traditionally they haven't been asked. And especially for our populations, our Spanish speakers, our indigenous language speakers, um, where that information has never been given to them or asked of them, they're very vocal and they want, this, they want to be heard. So I think there's so many benefits to continuing to ask partners to collaborate. And um, that's my contact information. I'm always available and willing to answer any questions. And um, like I said, we, we do offer so many programs, much more that I could, I don't want to take the time here to, to offer. But if you do have any questions, I'm always available. And uh, we're, we are active on social media if you want to follow us. So thank you. Thank you, Lizette. Um, it's just, you know, amazing how you've engage so many people, but also how you're really working with the assets of the community, uh, its language, its cultures, its traditions, and, and bringing those forward. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, and um, now we are going to turn to Chairman, uh, sorry, Chairwoman Norton. So uh, Chairwoman Norton, uh, take us away, please. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just delighted to see these presentations. I I'm so glad to go after them because I think it really grounds us in what the benefits are of these wonderful projects and how collaboration really matters. And um, at the chair of the CTC, um, what I am pleased to say is that due to the funding that we have and gas tax funding under SB1, we have a program called the Active Transportation Program, which some of you have applied for, but just in the three years that SB1 has been operating, we've funded over 2 billion ATP projects. And what I'm here to say in my CTC wearing hat is that collaboration partnerships really matter. And um, I was on a panel the other day with Pittsburgh Mayor Bill Peduto, and he talked about an important concept called the four Ps, which are people, planet, place, and performance. And I added on that panel that the fifth P needs to be partnerships. And the reason is because these ATP programs are actually five times oversubscribed. Um, they are highly competitive, but they're also so important to um, do the kinds of safety programs that we need to do at scale. And so I highly recommend the fact that with the projects that have been discussed that we also look at um, partnerships with organizations such as the business community, elected officials, and out of the box partners, because those help garner the very funds that are necessary and important to do the projects that we see at scale. I wanna thank Lizette for her wonderful projects because my children who are now 18 and 22 went to school in Westlake and Pico Union. And being able to make sure that the pedestrian experience, the bus experience was safe, has so much meaning to these communities that are highly, highly full of students and they're full of people who are transit dependent. Um, we're working on the same kinds of opportunities in downtown for with our work in FastLink DTLA, we have been supporting bus only lanes and protected bike lanes because there are so many times where car, bike and pedestrian interactions have been deadly. 
we are also working on how important it is to have good curb management because you have so many different vehicles trying for the same curb space. So as people are waiting to get on a bus, they're waiting to get a car, car share, or they're trying to unload a truck, we need to be looking at ways in which we are going to be using curb space better. And I think the future is about how we're going to use this precious space, how we're gonna look at signalization. We just at the CTC um, gave $17 million to the city of Los Angeles to improve their ATSAC signalization program because that protected right turns, uh, better walking and crosswalk signalization and, and even bus priority signalization are all safety elements. I wanna also make sure that we amplify the work we're doing with Fastlink DTLA on the concept of uh, safety and whether that means policing or whether it actually means that you want ambassadors that are going to accompany people on to transit and maybe through their trip as they walk back home, especially in the dark. We are looking at advocating for increased ambassadorship as we get people to use transit and to wait for transit, because I think more and more people are asking for the opportunity to um, walk safely, walk with a partner. And this is especially important as we look at women and seniors, as um, Councilwoman Reynolds mentioned, that, that, that the, the ability to have all of us travel safely and to be free from um, collision impact is so important. Um, in addition, I think it's also important that we look at the, the partnerships and generating support as it relates to the built environment. And that is looking at street lighting, looking at the opportunities for um, infrastructure enhancements so that where there needs to be shade, there's shade, where there needs to be new street lights, there are street lights and to look at other funding sources that would make that possible. Um, one of the things that I think is going to be incredibly important as we emerge from COVID-19 is that while people have always understood that every single human being is a pedestrian, not every human being in Los Angeles has had to really think about navigating the city as a pedestrian or as a cyclist or as a transit user, but I think as we have experienced COVID-19, we've seen what it's like to need to walk to the grocery store, find what we have access to as we're supposed to drive less, stay home more, and be safe. And I think what I am looking forward to seeing as we emerge from COVID-19, as we have learned more and more that our behavior affects other people and can really affects other people's ability to live and, and whether or not they they can live, um, it's so much more important that we start embracing that and, and putting that into survey data, putting that into um, webinars and seminars so that we can start having a broader coalition around safety as it impacts um, the walking, biking and transit experience. In addition, I want to say that one of the things that has meant so much as we're working with the California Transportation Commission is this year, we are starting what's known as our equity roundtable and our equity listening sessions. And the reason that that is so important for the state is that th we can be funding a lot of different infrastructure, but we need to make sure we understand where the gaps are. And I am so pleased that SCAG is investing in community organizations so that there is capacity building and that we are able to look at where the gaps are and making sure that those right applications are going to address those gaps. Um, but mostly, I want to make sure that every single person on this call is going to participate in those listening sessions because every story you have, every experience you are experiencing is important to let the state know. It's not just important for the localities because we're thinking broadly about how to program funds to address some of these very inequities. 
Um, and because they're highly competitive, partnerships are going to be even more important, knowing that this is a project that's going to get done, that this is a project that's going to have um, support in the community, that a broad base of residents, um, business owners, elected officials, community organizations supports this is essential to differentiating your project from everyone else's. And um, in this time of scarcity, we want to make sure that really good projects rise to the top. And so I so appreciate AAA and SCAG making sure that we are clear about how these partnerships really garner the right kinds of um, activity, the right kinds of funding, and, um, and really bring organizations together that weren't um, good partners before. I, say specifically, um, the work we're doing with Fastlink DTLA is bringing business improvement districts, uh, the Building Owners and Management Association, U.S. Green Building Council, um, and community organizations together to talk about how we reinvigorate a downtown that was very much a car and a parking-oriented culture into something that people navigate differently that we, we wanna see safety on the streets. We wanna see safety as we're waiting for transit. We wanna see different kinds of um, transit shelters and, and more shade because we are experiencing in this year, one of the hottest years ever. And so thinking about how we are also creating the kind of go human experience and thinking about what it's like to actually be that person that's in the, uh, transit experience is so important. And I would just suggest that all of you take the time to actually consider taking walking tours, to have the kinds of experiences that with the business community and others that aren't necessarily experiencing life as a transit rider, that, that we give people the ability to do that. I think Metro has been a great partner. LADOT has been a great partner in that wanting to get more people to use the system and being even willing to do some test runs or free tap cards just to get people to really put themselves in the position of the of the pedestrian or the bike rider or the transit rider. And so what I want to make sure that we come away with is that we wanna address the, the racial inequities. We wanna address modal inequities. We wanna look at how our um, active transportation program can help solve some of these thorniest issues. But I also wanna make sure that for communities that are impacted by freeways, and it's pretty much all of us around the Skag region, that now one of the CTC's other programs about the highway program is adding into it a component called Complete Streets. And so if there are projects that you are looking at that have a um, freeway on-ramp or off-ramp or underpass that you are also working with, those complete streets elements are also very important as we look at, a, at the go human kinds of um, mobility and funding sources. Um, I think more than ever, there has been a need with the governor and the legislature on down to look at how we're gonna travel with zero emissions, how we're gonna be safe, and how we're gonna to move together in new ways. And I think that's an opportunity to have bigger conversations about how our whole mobility ecosystem is going to change. And so I, I just am pleased to be here to talk about my role both in CTC and Fastlink DTLA and how we can be a good partner together for these projects that are gonna be going forward and are gonna need greater investment because the need is even greater and the inequities are even higher, especially during COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman Norton. Um, and thank you for, you know, your, your passion and your, you know, your clear interest and desire for engagement and partnerships. And um, what I hope we can do now is, is to start to go a little deeper into like how these things happen. Right? And, and to tap into the wisdom of, of the panelists, um, but also to tap into the wisdom of our audience. So I would encourage everybody to please um, 
post some questions into into the chat. Um, but as as you all do that, um, I'm gonna um, kick us off a little bit, and um, I'm gonna come back to uh, Councilwoman Reynolds. Um, so, um, you know, the I think we we have to acknowledge that overall there's a lot of fear or distrust or trepidation about about government and, and working with government, right? Um, but on the other hand, you just presented a project that if I were to use adjectives, it was fun, it was uh, creative, it, you were partnering with artists, you were partnering with, you know, residents, you were partnering with, you know, different members of the community, and then more and more people seem to get involved. But I wonder if you can help folks to kind of like understand from your perspective, one, so what what tips or advice do you have to offer to people who might want to approach a council office but really aren't quite sure how to go about it or might be you know afraid of of what might happen um so you know what what advice do you have but also what what do you look for um, from your perspective in terms of like how to build an effective partnership um, sure, there's a there's a lot there, and I, I appreciate um, your sort of recognizing the the fun and collaborative aspect of our project. Um, there was absolutely a, a lot of work and a lot of hurdles, a lot of unexpected surprises. Um, halfway through, the community organization wondered whether we should take the project down early um, because of the stress. Uh, uh, in continuing to keep the project in place, and there were there were community members who were unhappy with either the surprise or um, the fact that they had to slow down. Or um, I learned about this very interesting um, uh, anti roundabout movement, which I wasn't aware of before. Um, so it, it was challenging, and and I think that the um, that was another benefit of the collaborative nature of the project was sort of being able to encourage each other throughout the process when we ran into these different obstacles. So I like to remember that the positive memories certainly, um, it, it was absolutely a lot of work. And again, uh, it was the first time um, that our city has done a project like this, the, the community-led design, um, uh, uh, collaboration in the implementation of the project, um, and the pace at which we went from design to build um, was, was really unprecedented. So um, I'm excited that we learned a lot. Uh, in terms of approaching your council members, um, I guess I'll share my story. I, uh, I was elected two years ago. Um, it was only three years ago that I really became interested in local government. Um, I'm not a policy person. Um, I'm a Sort of problem solving person and I realized that problems I was complaining about more and more needed to be addressed at the local level. So that's where I put my energy. Um, I was not, I didn't, I don't think I used the word walkability or bikeability before I um, really got engaged. Um, I knew inherently from having spent my college years in a very walkable city about sort of the benefits that I, I recognized that I didn't experience, frankly, in, in Orange County growing up here. Um, I started to learn about the benefits of walkability from residents who were poking and pestering me about it. Um, uh, one of my gifts when I was elected two years ago was a, a book on walkability from a community member. So, you know, I read it and it was fascinating. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to America Walks. Um, through recommendations from my community members, I applied for and was accepted to the America Walks Walking College, which is a six month wow. curriculum on everything from, you know, the, the why it's important and all of the, the different strategies and benefits way beyond what I was aware of as, as, as a council member. Um, so, I would encourage um, residents who may be sort of frustrated that their council hasn't made a priority of, of um, active transportation to really focus on that education aspect. Um, what Chairwoman Norton suggested to invite a council member on a walk to experience that, a whole different perspective that you get. And I'll, I'll admit, 
things that I didn't never even considered um, before I started walking and biking more um, just really, really opened my eyes. So um, having inviting council members to have that experience and then sharing with them the data on, on the benefits, not just safety, safety huge, of course, but the, I think a lot about the community resilience that comes from the connections people make by seeing each other face to face. Um, in my last example, I shared the economic benefit of bringing people out onto the street. When people are on the street, they recognize businesses they never noticed before. They spend their money at those businesses. Um, of course, there's sustainability benefits, getting people out of their cars and on their bike. So um, I really encourage the education. I, I, um, I admit, again, I didn't know a lot about this stuff two years ago. And, and what I've learned about the benefits of walkability and bikeability is, is why I'm so passionate and persistent on this topic. Thank you. Um, so, um, Lizette, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, so to turn this question around a little bit, right? So, so you're working with, um, with folks who speak in dialect, who, um, you know, are generally are not, you know, the type who are engaged in kind of like public processes, right? Um, I, you know, and I wanted to ask you first off from your perspective and from really the, the residents' perspective, what kind of partnerships are important to them? Right. I think that you know we oftentimes things are designed as if okay we want folks to plug in, but I wanted to ask you the question from the other way around. If if you were to design a partnership or a system and it, keeping in mind all the things that that you do in terms of like valuing culture, language, norms, um, how what suggestions would you have for folks? So I, um, I alluded to at the beginning of my presentation that we, uh, since Central City Neighborhood Partners, um, another recent project of ours was the Great Streets Initiative through the city of uh, Los Angeles. And we did use SCAG, um, SCAG and Go Human um, materials for some of those activations that happened on Alvarado Street. So we were um, out there during that time about a year ago where we engage the community a lot and the design of uh, any possible changes on Alvarado Street. And so we were able to really hear from the community that they see people out there, you know, making changes, um, but they don't know what's happening because they're not informed. So I think it's really looking at how is that information being shared with the community um, and I think just simple things uh, like for us, a banner educational board um, that can be in other languages um, and that speaks to them. Um, so they may be curious. So um, our project, that project was on um, Alvarado Street right in front of the Metro station um, between uh, 7th and Wilshire. So us being out there or just having someone out there, we were in brightly colored shirts and telling them like, hey, you know, this is, you walk, we see, we, we've been out here for a week. We see you every day. Um, talk to us about this project. What, what would you need to be involved? Um, and I think the thing we heard the most is people just don't ask us, you know, they, they no one, we just don't get asked the question. Um, and I, I think when you ask the question um, and are curious, then you'll get the response. Um, if people see that you're really interested. So I think that making the conversation an easier one um, by being out there with them. Um, and I, I see that with this time of COVID, um, we've had challenges um, in communicating with our com with the community because not everyone has Zoom. Uh, not everyone has uh, technology to access. And um, when I think about the difference that we can make is that the hours that are availability, you know, we're not nine to five. And so when a lot of these projects are, you know, we work nine to five, this is our structure that puts limitations. So um, I think just really think, trying to think outside of the box, um, what does your engagement level look like? And being able to, you know, if, if the uh, transportation agency is not able to do that, I think that's the value of the community-based organizations because I know we are. And um, 
and combining together to benefit the community and giving them a true voice. Um, so I, I think just being asked to come to the table is what the community wants. And, you know, why did you put up this piece of art here versus, you know, maybe something uh, that we would have chosen? Or why did you choose these colors versus something that, you know, maybe those colors are gang related and uh, some more neutral colors would have made a better choice. So that, that would be my response, just inviting them in more. Okay, thank you. And then um, now I'm gonna toss this question to Chairwoman Norton because it also, I, as, as a follow-up, I wanted to ask you like, you know, so you mentioned the equity roundtables, right? So um, can you talk a little more about them and about the structure and how somebody gets involved? But, you know, how can we make sure that um, the folks that Lizette's talking about who say, hey, nobody's asking us, but we have a lot to offer, can participate in that. I think that's a great question. And, you know, one of the things about COVID that Lizette appropriately pointed out is that now we can have a lot more people participating in hearings because they're participating on Zoom or in these these ways. Um, and of course, we know that there are some people who are technologically challenged and can't necessarily participate in the hearings that are gonna be conducted in 2021. Um, so the early part of next year. Um, but I think that's what's so great about having community organizations that can speak for people and to say, here's what we need, here's what we've found um, to, identify if there are some languages that, that materials need to be translated into um, to make sure that we can highlight where gaps are. Uh, there's gonna be more information as we um, come and get our equity round table with uh, the full plan and we'll be happy to give that out. But I just wanna say that there are going to be these opportunities to participate and really share lived experience that is going to be a um, really revelatory opportunity because so many people are in need. And um, during COVID-19 with, with broadband and mobility differences and these inequities, they've just been more and more profound. And so we really want to be hearing from everybody um, in these ways. And I'll be happy to provide you more information on that as it comes. Thank you. So um, to be continued, sounds like. <laughs> okay, so um, I have a question I want to um, pose to, to all the panelists and you can just answer as you want, but it, it has to do with um, not just partnerships, but how, how, information, how, how information flows and, and really to think about the flow of information rather than I think like, um, you know, is brought up about you know survey data, for example. Um, but I'm I'm wondering about how we can connect lived experiences with with data and decision making, right? How can we make sure that there's there's opportunities for lived experiences to shape the decision making process? So I'm gonna just pose that to to anybody who would like to take that. I'll, I'll start. Um, absolutely, I'm a, I'm a researcher in my profession. Um, so the, the data piece, sort of the quantitative data piece is something I naturally um, gravitate towards and see as something very valuable for a conversation. Um, and we did, I didn't share that here, but the um, uh, part of the Costa Mesa Alliance's um, grant and strategy was to collect some pre and post speed data um, it was really interesting uh, as they were analyzing those, those data um, to see even just differences in how we present those data to community members versus um, the transportation team. So uh, again, part of my education um, has been what's influential to my constituents and what's influential and necessary to the transportation team in terms of the way they, they make decisions and evaluate projects. Um, but the I'm, I'm hesitating because I, I don't know if this is the way things should be. Um, certainly the anecdotal stories and uh, are, are important as well, right? We 
we're more inclined to make um, improvements that protect the safety of a five-year-old or a senior, right? And so sharing those stories um, are, are important. What concerns me about what I understand has, has stimulated a lot of action in the past is that we wait for collisions to happen. And that's one of the conversations that's ongoing now is that we like we shouldn't do absolutely we need to address issues where collisions have actually happened, but we can't keep waiting for them to happen too. So um, I am very interested in the discussion of how we continue to get feedback on near misses um, where people or where people don't walk because they're afraid of, of right. We're never going to see a collision if people aren't walking. Yeah, please. Turn on. Uh, I, I just I wanted to uh, amplify that and that also that people are not really understanding that your walking trip may be the thing that and the lack of safety in that walking trip is preventing you from being a rider in transit. And so I think we really need to start amplifying that we should not be someone shouldn't have to die so that there's a stop sign at an intersection. Someone shouldn't have to die to say that we need a, a better crosswalk. Um, and that if we wanna know how to bring ridership back onto transit when we're getting the additional funding, it's making the walking experience better. It's making a biking experience better. And I don't think there are enough conversations about what it means to take a whole trip. And so I just wanted to really amplify what you're saying. And I appreciate you saw that I was just nodding furiously because that conversation needs to come up more and more in the data as well. We're not capturing how far people walked to get on that bus. We're not capturing some of the data that now with technology the way it is, we should be better at. And we should be talking about that as um, better, um, you know, active transportation as a way of facilitating more transit ridership and getting people out of their cars for good. Yeah, yeah we had a, a conversation um, actually just yesterday, uh, um, positive progress from our, our project is that we're having a lot more conversations now. Um, this is with uh, myself, another council member, our um, transportation engineers and our city manager. And the last part of our conversation was related to this is, you know, is our is a, a next plan of action a study to address known safety issues? Or should we be focused on how do we create an environment where people want to walk? So a lot of the strategies within that are the same, but they're different goals, right? Instead of how do we keep people safe from known issues, how do we get 30% more people walking is a, is a different question. And, and um, I'm starting to lean much more towards this, you know, positive vision of, of the kind of community we want to create. I think it, we address the safety issues as part of that, but we also acknowledge many other benefits. Um, making walking pleasant, right? Not just safe is, is a huge part of, um, I, I think should be a huge part of our strategies. I just want to add the, you know, what is the data? So I think that the data, the questions that are being asked, I think are as are important because um, if it's just not just, but if it's safety related only, we're not going to understand that lived experience. So really being able to um, hear, you know, what is it like for someone who's on uh, using a, a walker to walk to the bus stop? wait there without a shade cover and get on the bus to get to the market. Um, so I think that lived experience from different perspectives is important um, to, to really hear uh, from our community. And also looking at the length of time. What I heard a lot when I, um, in some of our projects um, is people have been out here before, it's still the same and nothing is being done. And I think I, I, I'm not an urban planner, you know, but I, I know I can understand and appreciate the length of time to make decisions and to get that change out and the funding to make the change. But there's that gap in, okay, we've already told you this three years ago, that project's not done and you're back here again asking what else we can do. So I think that uh, communication or updates, I, I don't know, I don't have a recommendation to have how we can make that better, but I, I think that streamlining something so that people can see that actual change and not 
you know, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, it's something that um, them themselves can experience. It would be significant to, to, to see how that can possibly change or be improved. I'll just share 100 percent. I heard that, too. Thank you for mentioning that, Lizette. And, and uh, I think that's another one of the things that drives me is that I heard that and I say, well, well, I'm a new council member. Like, trust me this time. Right. And so, and so I better deliver because uh, I don't want them to be saying the same thing about me, too. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, I, I know in our work, we hear that all the time as well. Um, you know, and, and because we know that infrastructure change can take a long time and, and an amazingly long time. Um, I think um, Councilwoman Reynolds and, and Lizette, you both presented strategies that use arts and culture and i kind of want to lift this up for a minute because it, it is a process that it's immersive and participatory um, but it taps into the wisdom of the community but i wonder if you could each speak a bit more about how that came to be in in your work So I, I can uh, share that I think that is just um, as we engage in the community, there's no one particular art or, or culture. I think for us, we're just open to what will make it a more livable and engaging experience so that people can be connected. And I think that's the benefit of art. Um, in our projects, we've used a lot of color um, music, kind of engagement activities, so that people feel connected. I think it's the connectivity that um, that art and cultural music can bring to a project. And um, I know that with our, our, our Great Streets project, that that one really, um, we were saying, you know, who, what is the culture for Alvarado? And I think that is something that is just, it's so inclusive that it doesn't have to be, you know, Thai culture, Mexican culture. It can be the culture of the community of the people who pass through Alvarado Street, for example, or through our Westlake Pico Union communities. And uh, I think just that infusion of music, um, color, and giving that space to have a creative process within that the, the community is what will make the project su successful. Um, when I saw Council uh, Women Arliss's uh, the project in Costa Mesa, it really you know reminded me of uh, of our of the uh, crosswalk we did with the uh, Skag and Gil Human Materials to um, on Alvarado Street, and then that, that infusion of color, people get excited. It's not the black asphalt with the white lines that I have to cross between. Um, so I think any infusion of life, in a way, um, will help that project along. Yeah, we, I think we had two um, initial strategies and then were um, maybe pleasantly surprised by the, the spark of community, community connection um, uh, as the project sort of took life. Uh, the strategy, I think, initially was just coalition building, right? Who are all the different stakeholders who who can buy into this process and help move it forward through, um, again, that sort of mounting interest and, and pestering and persistence. Um, Costa Mesa is city of the art, so, you know, infusing art into a project was an important part of sort of our, our citywide um, goals. Uh, also, um, similar to what Lizette mentioned, um, is this idea of reimagining our streets as public space. And, and again, in, in, I always compare my experience growing up in Orange County, very car-centric culture with the years that I lived in Boston for college. Um, because I lived that experience, I had a whole new concept about how public space could be used, but I recognized that for many people, if you're not on these webinars that SCAG is hosting, right, the streets are the streets. Those are for cars. Like nothing else happens in them, right, except for maybe some once a year festival. So 
um, our project was called Reimagine, right? So we wanted to sort of bring to life a, a exhibit, right, through a physical project, um, how streets could be used in other ways and enjoyed in other ways. Um, the, the connections piece was a special surprise. So we created this art, we created the project, and as I shared, there were musicians that weren't part of our plan who showed up. And that was a really cool um, uh, side effect that um, I've learned is not unique. And uh, um, I hope that, that being able to see that um, helps shape a vision for, for the community we'd really like to, to have. Thank you both. Um, we have a, we have a um, shy audience <laughs> who doesn't seem to be asking a lot of questions. So I'm not, it was not my intent to be asking the majority of questions. So I just wanna, um, okay. Um, and um, so, um, but there, there is a question um, uh, which is an important one, which is about, you know, there's always a kind of a tension and a balance uh, and a fine line that, that we walk about or that, that we that comes about as as we talk about walkable and bikeable neighborhoods um, and the question about gentrification. And um, I want to I want to ask each of you from your perspective, you know, what what advice you, you might have around around that. I'm looking to the other two as as experts in this area, having having um, worked directly in it for a little bit longer. Um, but I'll share that that's it's absolutely something I think about a lot. Um, my the district I represent is my hometown, and and um, I do uh, my home neighborhood, um, and it's it's one of the it is the di most diverse area of our city, and I think a lot of the why people love that neighborhood, who live in that neighborhood, is because of that diversity. Um, it also happens to be this sort of untapped land, biking distance from the beach. Um, if you look at the Calum virus screen, it's like the, the closest disadvantaged community tract to the ocean. And so um, I'm very, very conscious of this sort of struggle between how do we um, create community benefits, but protect residents and avoid displacement. And we're um, certainly thinking about that as we go through our housing update process as well. Um, it's research I'm, I, I want to learn about. And, and the only strategy that I, I um, sort of know to execute now is to continue to bring current residents to the table and diverse residents to the table to sort of build leadership capacity locally to strengthen the voices and strengthen the community connections. Um, locally. I would add um, that we look at the SCAG um, RTP SES and just the fact that the Regional Transportation Plan and the Sustainable Community Study is looking at how to address dis um, displacement based on gentrification and that I think we, we need to make sure that we create safe communities and then also follow that up with you know, transit-oriented community development um, that is with, with Metro, with other state programs is, is targeting um, income levels that allow people to stay in communities. I mean, it, there shouldn't be this sense of as soon as our community gets nice, we can't be here. That's awful. We can't have safety be a reason that people then no longer feel that they can stay. Um, so I think that that one of the things just to know on the state level is that the uh, California Transportation Commission, the California Air Resources Board and the Housing and Community Development Department are meeting quarterly to talk about issues like this. And this is one of the things that we want front and center in our next meeting is in April of next year, but really identifying, are, are we seeing gentrification? What are ways we can make sure that we can keep communities whole and allow um, safety to still prevail and have imp community improvements not mean that you're gonna have um, displacement. And it's something that is part of every single discussion. It will be part of our equity hearings. And I think we just have to continue to raise it um, because we need new housing everywhere. And I think the opportunities to create 
uh, housing that is adjacent to transit, that's adjacent to bike lanes, and focusing on affordability is going to be important as an anti-displacement strategy. Yeah, and, and for, from my perspective, um, working uh, as a community-based organization, we purposefully look for opportunities and grants that will allow us to speak on, to engage the community and, and uplift their voices to speak on these uh, concerns and about, you know, what do they want to see in their community? Um, and we did hear that, you, you know, we were told you just want to do these changes um, because you're going to bring other people here um, because of gentrification. So I, I think that for us, it was a good conversation to have and say, you know, as an organization, we purposefully wrote on behalf of Westlake Pico Union communities to bring these changes now um, for your benefit, um, that where our goal is not to um, change the, the space for, for others, but for the community who's here now, um, because no matter, you know, for, for us, it's, you know, if you're from a, a low income, a community, you have as much right as anyone else from a more affluent area to be safe, to walk in a beautiful space. You know, why do you have to go to another community? You have to go to Pasadena to go walk outside and, uh, you know, shop. And um, if you have those shops here and we just have to make it safer for you. So I think that helping, again, taking it back to why we're on the panel is the partnerships with uh, community-based organizations and um, to have that connection with the community and not looking just at, you know, helping them understand that it's, the purpose is for safety for everyone and not just for one group or the other um, and in, in engaging in that conversation. Yeah, and, and I think um, I'll just add that I think Something that I, I noticed in in the work that you do, Lizette, is is that it's you're you're not looking at things in terms of an isolated issue, right? There's always a connection. I mean, we can't think about traffic, transportation as as isolated incidents, right? They're connected to housing. They're connected to basic needs. They're connected to services. And so I'm encouraged, like when Chairwoman Norton, when you mentioned the various different commissions, but I, but I think also, you know, we have to think about these things as, as you know, in tandem and, and they, everything is, is connected when we're talking about a community. Um, there was a question, I know Chairwoman Norton, you uh, mentioned that information is forthcoming about, about the equity sessions, but is there uh, a link or something that, that uh, everybody can, can uh, follow to make sure that they, they're aware of when these are happening and can participate? Yes, I'm gonna try to, as soon as I get off this call, actually I was texting people about like making sure we had that link in some place on our um, website. So I will make sure that we follow up with that information. And I've given my email for people so that you can, you know, touch into me in like early next year and we'll get you that information. Okay, thank you. And mm -hmm. also, Mike, the, uh, Dorothy has a couple questions in the chat too. Yes, and I was actually um, going to ask Dorothy uh, if you could ask them directly because I, I didn't yeah. want to interpret. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I just wanted to um, uplift the question from Steve. Um, I wasn't able to get the end of it, but it was something about given the seemingly omnipresent present push, if, if Steve wouldn't mind um, speaking, oh, there's the question. Um, given the om seemingly omnipresent pushback, every time we attempt to reimagine or modify our streets, what strategies should we use to inspire residents to take a long view of these improvements rather than the typical immediate fear of change? I'd like to suggest in my work that uh, we did about um, an ATP grant in the arts district, for example, or the work I'm doing in my own community, Eagle Rock or downtown. I think people have forgotten how many people access businesses without a car. And when we started getting information to the businesses about how many people actually walked there or biked there or got out of transportation and went to their business, 
that perception of whether or not this one parking spot in front of the business was the reason to prevent a, a bike lane suddenly went away. Um, not always and not easily, but I'm just saying that the more that we are giving information about how accessibility does not take away from um, customers is really important. And I think we have to continue in this COVID world to be really sensitive about that because now businesses are as frightened as they've ever been about staying in business. It's important that we show in um, imagery, in, in surveys, in, in even a bill, uh, some way to give a card that says, you know, I walked here and I shop here. Um, that I think would help people a lot more. And, um, and just the understanding that you might not lose the time you may lose in, in getting to someplace, maybe a life you save, and it may be a life of a neighbor or someone in your own family or yourself, um, I think is really important. And hopefully this year, we've been more able to recapture some of that humanity and I think really, really starting with everybody's shared uh, values is really, really important. And the more that we talk about what our shared values are and what makes a great city or a great town, I think that's gonna help a lot more. But we have to show that everybody comes to the table with their own fears and perspectives and need for customers. And if we can just start from a position of mutual respect and, and ask for it back, I think that's really changed a lot of thinking about some of these things in ways that have been resonating throughout communities after that. Like, like certain projects actually changed how neighborhoods engage with each other. And that's really the sign of something really, really successful is that you grow together and you start being a functioning team or street or business district together because now you have a shared success. Yeah, the, the shared experiences, um, I, again, I think is, is critical and both experiencing the streets in a way um, you haven't maybe normally, but others might, um, whether it's sort of directly taking that walking path or hearing the anecdotal stories. Um, we've learned that visuals are so important, um, you know, creating something 3D versus a, a drawing on paper has been pretty impactful. Um, but I might remind myself and, and our staff too that, um, Mike, you alluded to this earlier, that often the voices we hear at, at City Hall or now virtual City Hall are the, the no voices, right? And the, the um, people speak up when they're against something more than when they're for something. Um, and also it's, it's a small fraction of our population that's paying attention to, to um, to what's happening at City Hall. And I say that fully acknowledging that I think we as a City Hall have a responsibility to be better about being accessible um, as well. But I, um, a lot more people drive than walk in my city, right? So if we just take the majority opinion, we're not gonna be building infrastructure for people who walk. So I, I think that, that we also have to be um, whether we call it sort of courageous or just more, um, uh, uh, Sort of long viewed on the benefits of this and just commit. Uh, we know we know these benefits exist, and we're going to have to um, sort of work through uh, some voices that that are in opposition. Okay, um, oh, I was going to pass right to you, Andres, because uh, I think we are at time. But I wanted I want to first off I want to thank. The panelists um, for your openness and your you know, your candor, and um, but also just for for what you're doing day to day. And uh, Andres, uh, back to you to close yeah. this. Uh, thank you, Mike, so much for your moderation, and thank you to Councilwoman Reynolds and Chairwoman Norton and Lizette for uh, the remarks that you shared and and the stories that. Um, that you shared as well uh, about your great uh, work. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, hopefully you have some food for thought on efforts that uh, can advance transportation safety during the pandemic and beyond. Uh, 
As a reminder, all presentations will be emailed to registered participants. And if you have any questions or follow-ups, um, please feel free to reach out to the panelists directly or to any of the uh, session organizers. And I also want to make a plug that, you know, the, the uh, panelists spoke about SCAG mini grants and that um, Go Human, the Go Human mini grants will be um, a new round of funding will be coming up uh, next year. And at this point, we want to know, in, especially in the shifting environment, how those can best service uh, those really effective, innovative, and creative strategies. So um, we hope that you take inspiration from the partnerships described in this uh, presentation and try to, in, and then look to SCAG for some uh, resources too. And we'd love to hear your feedback on, on that opportunity as well. So again, thank you all. Thank you join, for joining us and we hope that you stay safe and healthy. And I also wanna thank, thank you. Uh, uh, the Auto Club of Southern California for their partnership throughout this series. It's been great working with you, Marianne, to uh, run two fabulous panels. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you for having Thank us. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.